Welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today we have Chris Rowe of Rowe Hunting Resources. And Chris, we have been doing a series basically on, uh, you know, elk tactics, elk behavior, elk vocalizations, and uh, doing a little bit different. A lot of times you and I get into really good, you know, hour and a half, hour and 45 minute conversations uh, I thought about breaking these up a little bit and just making a little bit shorter clips and segments so people could, um, you know, a lot of times people don't have that hour and a half to listen. Uh, on this episode, I want to cover uh, calling elk uphill, downhill, or on the same level terrain as you. Uh, I want you to tell me if your preference is to call them, you know, if they're above you, below you, or on your same level and why why each of those scenarios are important and kind of your strategy for each of those scenarios yeah i mean if, if uh i guess if, if i get to choose on the if i'm on a bench or if i'm on the level or if i'm you know working across the landscape and there's a main elk trail that cuts across that mountain if I can call them horizontally, I will. I mean, it's just the easiest path of least resistance. I, if I can call them horizontally, uh, I will do that. If so, if you, I you will try however, and get. So first and foremost, it's just so I'm hearing you correct. You will try and get on their same level if possible. Yes, yes, and and a lot of and there's I guess two reasons for that. I, I touched on the one. If, from a, a travel standpoint, from a, a energetic standpoint, it's easy for an, especially if you had a main trail cutting across the mountain or you know through the timber or whatever. It's easy for that elk just to just to cruise. It's just, there's no elevation gain. It's just an easy stroll. Boom, done. Easy enough. But the other thing too, depending on the, the time of day, you know, if you're especially if you're in the mountains and you've got thermals uh, in in play, whether it's a downdraft or an updraft or whatever. If you've got a consistent sort of wind that's going uphill or downhill, if you can call them parallel to the to the to the mountain or perpendicular to that wind direction, you, you kind of have a little bit more predictability. That a you know again I talk talk about the see you first, hear you second, smell you third principle. There are if you call correctly, they're going to want to come in to where they can see you easily, and if you make it easy for them to do that, they're just going to march right in. And at that point, your your scent is going left of them or right of them. It's going perpendicular to where they're coming in. And at that point as well, depending on where you set up on the train, depending on how that animal's moving across the landscape, you can position yourself to make sure that you're either up, you know, upwind of that, or excuse me, downwind of the animal so he gives, goes upwind of you and doesn't get your scent. Um, you know, my next preference would be trying to get uphill of an animal, only because it seems it can be a little bit more difficult to see up through timber and branches and grasses and everything else, and it's just kind of hard to look up, but if you're on a little ledge or if you're on a little bench or, or whatever from a high position, you can look down and you can see movement below you very easily. So if I can pull that animal uphill to me, that's my next best option. The problem, though, is if it's in the morning, and those thermals are still going down, well, now you're you're flirting with the possibility of that animal just easily, conveniently for their purpose to say, well, I'm going to approach him and try to get visual contact, but, geez, I can take 10 steps to my left or right or whatever, and I can also scent check them. So being uphill or downhill of an animal is good, but you... At that point, you really need to know what your your wind is doing because otherwise they can just easily slip in uh, downwind of you. And then, you know, I've I've called bulls to me uh, from a position lower than they are, but every single time, you know, we talk, we talk about the doorway all the time on this, you know, with your podcast. Yeah, every single time, I make sure that I. And in a spot where that doorway, because most of the time those animals are going to come in and they're going to get to a little clearing, they're going to get to a little point, they're going to get to the lip of this little bench, they're going to get to some little elevation grade, they're going to stop, they're going to bear, and they're going to look down in, and more often than not, 
if I'm calling to them from a position lower than they are, they stand and they stare and they stare and they stand and they just, they don't, they they just use the elevation to their advantage, and they stand there and wait to see movement from the animal that I'm, you know, the, whether it's I'm cow calling or whether I'm using full vocalization. They're, they they expect to see an animal down there, and from their position, they expect to be able to see some movement. And so they'll stand a lot longer. If I'm calling them uphill or if I'm calling them across that slope, usually, usually I can get them to come in a lot quicker, a lot more effectively. What about the dominance issue of, you know, bull to bull, let's say you're bugling back and forth with the bull. Um, you know, I've heard it said where a bull wants to have the uphill ground, he wants to have the high ground so that if a bull approaches him from below, he's got, you know, weight and leverage that he can, you know, have some dominance there. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that can actually play into it as well. I, 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 I think sometimes it, you know people might perceive. It, well, let me take a step back. I'm not going to say that it's not happening, and I can absolutely, from a human standpoint and, and from a behavioral standpoint, that absolutely makes sense and absolutely could be happening. The other flip side of that, though, is I could make the argument that the bull swings in from the uphill side simply because it's easier for him to look down through stuff then up through stuff and so he can swing around to the uphill side keep him keep some distance between him and the the adversary or the potential threat that he's perceiving and he can visually see them better from an elevated standpoint so he can he can engage them visually visually without getting himself into the danger zone of, of getting too close and then running into a set of antlers make sense yeah that makes sense so it, it could be either way, but yes, you're absolutely right. If you're dealing with a bull, especially with bull cows or whatever you see, or a bull that seems cautious, yeah, sometimes they will swing to the uphill side just to get the elevation gain on it so they could either see or, you know, whatever, but they will swing up. You mentioned your principle, you know, the doorway principle. You mentioned see you first, hear you second, smell you third. And we've talked a lot about it, but I think it's just like, groundbreaking you know like no one's in my mind ever broke it down like that and i think it's so important and once i started grasping the doorway principle and doorway concept and and remembering see you first hear you second smell you third can you go over why that is so important for people that are trying to call elk why that principle those principles are paramount like the most important probably the probably even better than sounding really well those principles are super important to be successful well yeah we talked about it this is uh this is just a few episodes back we talked about that doorway it doesn't matter how good of a caller you are i mean it, it, seriously it doesn't it doesn't matter if i'm calling if, it, if it, you steve it, it doesn't matter it's irrelevant if you are not set up in a good setup, you're not going to harvest that animal. I mean, if you, if you, you know, you could sound like the best cow in the you know, in the world or the best bull in the world, but if if you're out of position where that animal just wants to lock up 80, 100, 150 yards away and sit there and stare at you and not come in, you know, everybody always talks about, oh, the bull hung up on me. Well, yeah, he, he stopped in his doorway where he should be able to see that animal that he's hearing and, and he couldn't see anything, so he's just going to stand there and stare. And if the terrain, if where you're set up does not lend itself to creating some sort of obstacle or confusion behind that area, you know, behind the area where you're calling from, there's no incentive for that bull to continue into your setup. More importantly, it actually encourages them. This is the you know, what you talk about: see you first, you smell, second, smell you third. It actually encourages them to swing around downwind. And elk is a visual animal. That's why they, they live in herds. The bulk of their, their communication is visual. I mean, they don't normally are out there just, you know, yammering their heads off constantly. Most of the time, it's all behavior. It's body language, ear position, head position, neck position, how they approach one another, whether they kick one another. It's all body language. It's all visual from the eyesight. So they want to engage you that way. And if you, and this is where I talk about, you know, calling, you know, if you call with a purpose, if you call strategically, if you call with a target, or whatever you want, however you want to put it, if you know what you're saying and why you're saying it, and you 
you call appropriately, then you will in, you, you will create an image in their head where they think they should be able to walk in and engage you visually. However, if you are just throwing out cow sounds, you know, I, that the, the example that I give in my seminars and the, on that YouTube video, you know, if you're out there just yelling pencils and automobiles and boot laces and steering wheels, you know, those are all, you know, words in the English language. But if I, if I was just yelling at a street corner saying, pencil, automobile, boot lace, <laughs> you know, people are going to look at me a little strange. I, why? I, I sound like a person. I'm talking. I'm, I'm talking like a person. I'm using words in the English language. What's wrong? Well, it doesn't make sense. It, it, you know, so it, that's going to set, you know, anybody hears that, you're going to go, what in the world? You're going to come into that situation. If you come into that situation, you're going to be on edge. Well, for an elk, if you're out there essentially figuratively yelling boot laces and automobiles, that doesn't make sense. And so they're going to be coming into that. They're going to approach that situation a little bit more cautiously. Now, from a communication standpoint, well, I can't see that individual. I can hear the individual, but that's not giving me the information that I need or the information I'm getting just doesn't make any sense. Well, from a communication standpoint, they can also communicate and, and understand one another through their nose. And so at this point, you've just set yourself up to where they're like, well, I can't see him. What I'm hearing don't make sense. I've only got one other option. I'm going to swing downwind, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to get your scent. You know, that's the other thing. People all the time are like, oh, you know, that I set up to cover the downwind side because, you know, they, they, they always swing around downwind. And then they get shocked when the elk just walks straight in on them. Well, again, if, if, if the reason why those animals are probably swinging around downwind is one of two reasons. Either that animal has run into other people before or run into other elk before and got himself in trouble, and so he's being a little bit more cautious, so he wants to, to check the situation before he even gets there. Or what he's heard you saying doesn't make quite perfect sense in, in his little world to where he's like, mm, something's not quite, I'm interested. I want to be there. I want to believe that there's another elk there that I, that I should be interested in, but I don't quite trust it, so I'm going to circle. Well, again, both those situations, your setup is crucial. If you understand the doorway where, the, where that animal is going to stop and engage and look to that first initial visual confirmation, wherever that is, they're going to stop there. I don't care if it's in front of you at 40 yards. I don't care if it's 13 yards in front of you. I don't care if it's 130 yards in front of you. It is there somewhere, and they will stop there. So to you know, identify those places where that animal should be able to stop and look is crucial. But then your calling, what you're saying, why you're saying it, is crucial in the fact that it can predispose how that animal comes in. If you're saying what you need to say for the right reasons and the right execution, do not be surprised. In fact, I don't. I actually count on it. They will come straight to you. They can come straight to you. If, if people want, if, if you, nothing else, if you just go to our YouTube channel. Uh, you I mean if they don't the want to spend problem. the 20 bucks to buy the elk module yeah, exactly. which has over exactly. 30 hours of video of all these things you're exactly. talking about? Exactly. If you don't want to spend the so 20 for bucks, you just cheap, go. For you cheapskates out there that just want to go to the YouTube <laughs> channel and don't want to spend 20 bucks, even though you'll spend 20 bucks in one day going to you know McDonald's eating a Big Mac. But Okay, go <laughs> ahead, Chris. Well, on our YouTube channel, we got, it, it, I think I called it like Bugling Master, you know, part two, where uh, this bull just, I mean, he was off on his own. He was seeking cows. I mean, it, of all the animals in the world, this was the easiest bull to ever call in. He was desperate to find somebody. But, I, but the thing I want people to watch about it is, is watch that video. Watch how far away that bull starts and then watch what that bull does and where he stops. That bull, there's a reason why the bull stops right there. And, and I talk about that in the, in the elk module, but because of the obstruction behind me, because of what he couldn't see behind me, I knew if I set up in front of that cover, he could not see clearly behind me, even though everything in front of him was wide open. That bull walked within, 30, I think it was 15 yards, maybe 14, 15 yards. 
I never had to stop him. I let him walk all the way to 14 yards and stop broadside right by me. Boom, on his own. He will, and then just kind of continue right on past me and continue to search the stuff behind me. If you get your setup right and you understand that doorway and understand that they want to see you, they want to make vision. If you, if you set up and you call to allow them their natural tendency to make visual eye contact, you will kill way more animals. Are there more? have a lot more animals hang up. Can there be multiple doorways? Absolutely. There are, there are absolutely. I mean, across, depending on the terrain and, and the timber and everything else, there's, there's going to be multiple places where animals can, you know, stop and look. But, I mean, any given setup, if you, if you take a look at your setup before, take a look at your area and choose your setup based off of those principles first. You can kind of dictate where you want it. You, you might get into a spot and be like, oh, this would be a great place to set up. And then stop, you scan the horizon, you're like, no, no, no. I actually need to make five more steps to my right. And now, rather than four different places, that animal can stop and look and, you know, ranging from four, you know, 40 to 80 yards. If I just take five to ten steps to my right or in front of me or behind me a little bit, now he has to come to 20 yards or the furthest place is 40 yards. Well, now I'm in range. Now now I'm in within my effective yardage. And, I, and, and I, I, I'm on my way to bow hunting, you know, our archery hunt, so obviously I'm, my perspective right now is bow hunting. But if you're a muzzleloader hunter, oh, my gosh. Who cares that the doorway's 40, 50, 80, you know, or more yards away, depending on the muzzleloader and depending on the season. Or if you're an early season rifle hunter, goodness gracious. The, the doorway might be 150 yards out there. Who cares? You can reach out and touch them. Get them to stop in that open. Get them to stop and look. If you know right where they're going to be, smoke them when they stop. You don't have to stop them. Is the doorway the first the first area that they can get to where they think they can make visual contact? In essence, yes. In essence. Yep. And, and, and it, again, the thing, uh, we're getting into the weeds on this one, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's it's where the animal that they are. It's okay, I'm going to pretend I'm a cow, or I'm, I, I'm going to pretend I'm an elk. I'm vocalizing. The animal I'm after is vocalizing. So it's me against him or her. The animal I'm calling to comes down the mountain or comes across the mountain. The doorway is their doorway, not mine. They don't. They can stop in a place where they should be able to see me and my movement, but that does not necessarily mean that I am going to be able to see them. So that's why it is critical to pay attention to these things to make sure you choose one that gives you that. So they're coming through thick timber so or in other whatever. Words, their doorway is where you can see it. Their doorway. Their doorway where yeah. they're expecting to see you, the caller where their doorway is in an opening to you. Yes. I don't care if they stop 80 yards behind cover and look at that. That doesn't do me any good. I want to choose the one. I, I want to pick one that forces them to come to a certain spot that I can that I can sniper them in when they step there. And you can do that, whether it's terrain, benches, saddles, uh, patches of timber, patches of cover. I, I I show this all the time on the strategies and action videos. I mean, heck, there's places where I'll just stop in the middle of an opening. I mean, there's hardly anything behind me, but if you look at what is behind me and the nature of the, of the terrain or the vegetation, you can see from the elk's perspective, it makes sense that there could be an animal back in there that they have to move forward and make visual eye contact with. So it pulls them closer. Let's throw another twist into that doorway principle and them looking you know, trying to come to a point where they can see your calling position. Let's throw a decoy into the scenario and give me your thoughts on that. Well, first of all, because I got a love yeah, hate, got, de- I got a love hate with decoys. But go ahead. Oh yeah, no, and a lot of people do, and that's and it's the same relationship I have, and I've got some friends that are decoy manufacturers who probably don't like me saying this, but I, the best. I mean, the best testimonial I've ever had from one of our subscribers was on one of our forum posts, and that question came up about the decoys, and and he he titled his response. It was perfect. Ditch the decoy, work the setup. 
and his whole point was he did not put as much stock, he didn't put as much faith in the, in the doorway principle as he should have. He had it, he nailed it. He, he spent the time, he, he practiced his call, he knew, he knew what he was saying, he knew why he was saying it, he knew what the animal was expecting, and he knew the doorway the animal was going to come to, but he doubted. And he just was, I don't know. And so he pulled the decoy out. And that animal came, I mean, the, cat, the animal did exactly everything that he was supposed to do, and as soon as that animal cleared the, the, the timber, hit that animal, boom, locked up, stood there, and stared, and stopped prematurely, guy never had a shot. And that animal just stopped, and he stared, and stared, and stared, and stared, and stared, and when he did, and when the bull saw that there was no movement, bull wheeled and just took off, boom, gone. And the only thing that stopped that animal was the fact that he saw that decoy. Otherwise, he would have taken two more steps and he would have walked there, he would have stood out there, and he would have eaten an arrow. So, and the guy was just beside himself. He's like, why did I pull the decoy? I didn't need to pull the decoy out. I had to set up perfect. So, yeah, if, if you work the setup, if you get the doorway right, 99% of the time you will not need a decoy. Now, with that being said, if I cannot, if it's just, if there's some reason, I just, the, the way the terrain, the vegetation, whatever, is just way too open, and I cannot close that gap, then maybe I'll pull out a decoy and, and, and use it. Or, more importantly, if yeah, I hunt solo, 90% of the plus time I'm by, by myself. This year I'll have some relatives with me and, and some other folks with me. So, if you're hunting with a partner, Two person, three person, whatever. If you've got a multiple person set up, now we're in a different realm. Now you can have somebody with that decoy back behind the shooter, have the shooter in that doorway, but have the decoy back off in the distance. Now it actually can can come in, you know, come in handy. But and we can die, we can rabbit hole down a, a decoy discussion, you know, body positions and what, you know what the style of decoy is. But most of the time. I, I I use a heads-up decoy because I like having that head. I like being able to have it just to flash it to show it if I need it, but most of the time it's on the backpack and it never comes out. Do you think the up. most effective use of decoy is if someone is with you and they're a considerable distance behind you? Because don't you think, how many times do they come to the doorway, they look over and they see the decoy and they stand there and stop, and they don't come to the decoy. And how many yeah, times do they come to the doorway, yeah. they see the decoy, and they come to the decoy? What's the percentage there? Most of the time, if, they are, if they're in a short distance, it depends on the style of decoy, it depends on what's happening with the decoy. If they come in and, and boink, there's a decoy there, again, again the style of decoy, especially those heads up, or not heads up decoy, but a decoy that has the head and ears in an erect forward position. Oh my gosh! That I more times than not, those animals will come in and stop and stand like a stone and stare. Why? Because that animal, they, the decoy they're looking at, is an alert posture. Its heads up, its ears are forward, and its ears are locked. They're not moving, and they help never have their ears static or steady or lock unless there's danger or they're or on a you know on alert so a lot of times there's some decoys out there where that head is in an alert posture the gears are an alert posture oh my gosh those will lock up an animal quicker than yeah absolutely yeah. i mean now, in essence it. wouldn't the best decoy be you know the the back you know you can a full body <laughs> of an elk with the head down Feeding. Well, there you go. That I is that I think that's either the Fred Eichler Montana decoy, or maybe it's the Miss September decoy by Montana decoys, or the best one I've ever. I I still have it today, and I use it from time to time. It's the elk butt decoy from Montana decoy. If you are going to have a an, an elk decoy and use it statically, it needs to be the rear end of an elk. In my opinion, it needs to be the rear end of an elk with a with its head down, or or with its head down. If you are going to use a decoy dynamically, like you're going to flag it, you're going to, you're going to show it, and then put it away and show it, put it away, heads-up decoy, the elk head from heads-up decoy is the best. 
if you're going to use a decoy to actually walk in on and out, then the predator decoy, that ultimate decoy or ultimate predator decoy that straps on your bow, that's a good one. I mean, each decoy is going to have its own pluses and minuses, but yeah, if it's just you're going to use a static object, my opinion, yes, the elk butt decoy or that this September and have it behind you away. So where if the animal locks up and stops in the doorway and he wants to you know, lock up a distance from the decoy, well, he's still in, in range of you. But if he wants to actually approach it, well, then it pulls him past you. Don't set the butt decoy or the, you know, like the ultimate predator decoy. Don't just have it standing static with you. I think you can end up running in more troubles than, than not. Good stuff there, Chris. My opinion. Um, on the next, My opinion. On the next episode, I want to cover a listener's question. It's, it's uh, fairly comprehensive, but he wants to know, uh, he's got an Arizona elk tag. He wants to know if he should be calling in the morning, sitting water in the evenings, uh, you know, chasing bugles in the mornings. He wants to know uh, glassing tactic strategies, and it, it's going to be a good episode. I want to thank you for spending time with us here. I want to give you a chance to let the listeners know uh, how they can find out more about you and more about that doorway principle and, and uh, you know, find out about the elk module and uh, for those people that are willing to spend 20 bucks, it's probably the, and you're an elk hunter, it's the <laughs> best 20 bucks you'll probably ever spend. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. I might be biased on that, but yeah. No, everything everything of ours is all under the Roe Hunting Resources. So R-O-E, huntingresources.com is our website. Yeah, subscribe to the elk module there. And what Jay talked about, if you use the, if, you know, for new subscribers, if it, you get a subscription, you can either get a free month, ends up being 20 bucks, or you can get the full annual access for a full year. It ends up being 40 bucks with the J. Scott podcast promo code. It's a coupon code. It'll, it'll be at the end of when you're checking out. So you're going to go through all the little checkout things that you can enter it. So, uh, but then on Instagram, uh, same thing, Row Hunting Resources, Facebook, or our YouTube channel. It's all Row Hunting Resources. So, yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on again. It's always fun. I enjoy having these conversations. Awesome. We'll look forward to the next episode and also remind the listeners that they can send me an email at jscottoutdoors at gmail.com. They can send me a direct message on Instagram at jscottoutdoors. And thank you to the sponsors that uh, make this podcast possible. I uh, want to remind the listeners, gohunt.com Insider is letting you guys have a 30-day free trial if you use the it's if you go to gohunt.com forward slash J Scott, you can get a 30 day free trial. You get full access to the Insider uh, program, uh, and you can check it all out, and uh, it, it's free. Uh, so uh, go to gohunt.com forward slash J Scott. Also check the show notes uh, for Kuyu Ultralight Hunting, where the mobile showroom is going to be uh, over the next couple weeks and months. Uh, phonescope.com and the outdoorsman's uh, Chris thanks I'll look forward to hearing from you on the next episode absolutely thank you